What were you guys doing last week in class? So I can get a sense of where you've been. I know the semester just started, but uh, was Professor Chloe in class last week or she was already injured? She was injured, but she was in class. Oh, okay. And what did you guys go over? Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, how many of you had the time to watch parts of The Godfather in preparation for today's lecture? How many of you have, se how many have not seen The Godfather? It's okay. I'm not going to give you a test. Okay. Uh, really important film in 20th century American film history. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola happens to be Italian-American, but he also happens to be a real formidable uh, filmmaker. Um, what are you doing next week? We don't have class this week. Uh, excuse me? We don't have class this week. Oh, how cool. Very nice. We call that a walk. When I was in school, we would call that a walk. So we don't have to go to class. Now, in general, I don't like um, uh, laptops or electronic media in the classroom. Uh, if that's your preferred way of taking notes, make sure that you are not busy surfing to uh, soft porn sites. And uh, uh, really, I'd really prefer, since I'm only going to take an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes of your time, that um, we stay focused together on the topic at hand. And the topic at hand, as you could see, is going to be the, the godfather. Um, my name usually is William Anthony, William Nericho, but for today, since I'm indulging my inner Italian Americanness, I'll go by the name I would have been, you know, I would have had in Bartana, Sicily, if my great grandfather had, my grandfather had never come over to the United States, and so my name would be Guglielmo Antonio Nericho. I love Guglielmo. I don't know, Guli, el Guli. Uh, you can call me Professor Guli for today. That'll be my new new identity. I'm so busy as a uh, uh, I'm, the, I'm a professor in the Department of English and Comparative Literature. Uh, I, I direct a graduate program in Cultural Studies, which I think is why Clarissa always has me come and guest lecture to her class. And that program is called the Malas Program, the Badass Program, uh, Master of Arts in Liberal Arts and Sciences. So if any of you are graduating and don't want to leave San Diego and want to continue doing this style of study, what you see today, look me up. Please call me, talk to me. Very easy to find me. My email address is memo at sdsu.edu. And that email address gives you a hint of the other ethnicity that lurks inside my uh, genomes or whatever it is. And I'm Mexican. I'm Mexican Sicilian. Uh, you know, on, on my grandfather's side, there's the Nerichos and my on my mother's side, there's the Garcias, the Berlangas, the Cañamars, you know, Mexicanos, they have thousands of names. So um, I'm one of these people uh, who, through the consequences of immigration and migration and also uh, geography, because the border crossed my family in Texas, we did not enter. So if you see Donald Trump, tell him I said to fuck off, OK? Um, the border crossed us, uh, I, I carry within myself uh, this curious trace of America's past. And we all do. Uh, all of us, to the extent that we identify with or visit or are Americans, we carry a trace of our history within our name, within the family stories that we carry, and within our, our, our heritage. Um, the title for my present today, presentation today is an Italian American Narchaeology. Not archaeology, Narchaeology. Because I'm going to be talking about drugs in American history, drugs in American cinema. It's not an accident that two shows in the late 20th century, early 21st century, excuse me, early 21st century, uh, Breaking Bad and The Sopranos, remake the history of television. Those two shows alone, their popularity signaled a quantum shift in the evolution of a hierarchy of American entertainment. Television now, in some ways, is more preeminent than film. You wouldn't have been able to have seen that coming. And yet, you're living through this transition. And your, your laptops uh, are part of, that, a part of that as well. 
So I'm going to talk about an Ameri Italian American narchaeology. It's going to be part archaeology in the classical sense, but it's also going to be a narchaeology because it will be an archaeology focused on drugs. Drugs and familia, familia and drugs. Violence, subjectivity, and ethnicity in Francis Ford Coppola's The, Gro the Godfather. Part of that, part of the focus of the scenes we're going to look at today, because we're going to watch some movies together. We're going to watch some key scenes from Coppola's Godfather. Um, are, I, I chose the scenes that I wanted to focus on because of the description of your course, right? This is a course in Italian-American culture. Uh, it wasn't too long ago that Italian Americans were suffering the fate of our Mexican American brothers now. And that is that the Italian American identity position was overdetermined, contaminated with negative associations. The, the various slurs that we associate uh, for Italian Americans, the WAP, the Guinea, all these things are bound up in the history of ethnic migration and the evolution of urban culture, especially urban culture, New York City, uh, Chicago, major sites of Italian American uh, emigration and then uh, expansion. So your course says that you were supposed to focus on Italian American experience of migration. So regardless of what your attitudes are towards migrants and immigrants, it's an area of study. We've got to remind ourselves of that. Uh, right now, it happens to be an area of study exploding on the planet because of what's going down in the Middle East. You know, Germany deciding to let in 100,000 uh, immigrants. Uh, you know, England will be following suit. We're witnessing now as, as humans a major moment in the history of immigration and migration. The Italian-American experience happened earlier earlier in United States history, but what we're witnessing now is, now is no less uh, complex. Identity formation, who you are. How much of who it is you are is bound up with, come on in, come on in. How much of who it is you are is bound up with your association with a nation someone you were re related to came from? You know, a lot of who it is we say we are is a result of our mother tongue whether it be English or Spanish or Italian, that idea of uh, for identity and identity formation is an important part uh, of, of an area studies course like, like, like this one. Uh, one more thing I want to say about identity formation. For Italian Americans, this, the success of the Godfather cuts two ways, right? And the negative association, of course, is, ah, all Italian Americans are mafioso, right? They're all criminals. They're all part of the mob. And so the success of the movie led to a, sp a perspective where the Italian-American identity formation was, again, I'll use the word overdetermined or contaminated by this idea of criminality. I said it cut both ways because it was so popular. Because The Godfather was so popular, because Godfather 2 was, if anything, and even uh, it was the sequel that denies the tradition of sequels because it was an even better film in some ways with Robert De Niro than the first film. We could get into a debate over that. Um, it cut both ways because the film was so popular, Italian Americans were happy. Hey, they know who we are. They don't think we're just criminals. We're scary criminals. Don't mess with us, motherfuckers, right? We're, we're going to. This, this is a value in the brand. And identities are, whether we like it or not, related to brands. We buy into them. We associate ourselves with them. And so the idea of the, of the mafioso, of uh, the mafia, of the organized crime and the Italian-American subjectivity are, in the short term, for our purposes, they're wedded together. Now, you know, how we navigate this fusion, that, that's up to, you know, to our discussion. Assimilation. The classic definition of the United States is that it is a melting pot. But for many ethnicities, the United States is a smelting pot. A smelter gets rid of impurities. Right? And so you might have heard that the United States is a melting pot. No, I've found it to be a little bit of a, a, a smelter also, which is to say you can become an American, but you're going to have to give up some shit. Right? You're going to have to give up something 
from the, from the motherland, maybe you're going to have to give up the mother tongue, right? As Sarah Palin says, let's all speak American. When, it, when, it, when someone in the public eye speaks in that way, they're speaking against the lived legacy of over 200 years of conflict in the United States that's made this country what it is. So it's just an incredibly rich time to be considering these things. You're wondering when I'm going to show the film clips. I'm getting to them. I'm getting to them, OK? Here we go. Um, assimilation, the smelting pot. Genres and media, from literature to film, music, theater. OK, so taught in English. All right, here we go. So here's my presentation, my title, right? Thank you to Clarissa Glo, and thank you to her students for inviting me to be here and, and, and lecture to you. I'm really happy to be here. I very rarely get to wear my Italian-American colors. I'm too busy being Chicano. But because I'm you know, split and bi-cultural, bi uh, tri-cultural, uh, today I can try to come off as an Italian-American, which is kind of cool. My Italian-American. Lineage, though, is very dicey. I have to tell you, my grandfather, Guglielmo Nericho. Hello? Was that my grandfather? Did he call? Yes? Dove un ristorante di chi vicino? Where's a good restaurant around here? It's, that's all the pathetic Italian, the, my pathetic Italian that I know. Um, Guglielmo Nericho comes to the United States in 1916, and he's in Philadelphia, he's in New York, he gets thrown in the penitentiary because he was running numbers. He was doing a little of the stuff that the young Vito would have done. It's what immigrants do to make a living in the city. Um, my father is born in 1920, William Nericho, and my grandfather, Guglielmo, dies in 1922 in a mysterious motorcycle accident. He'd gone back to Philadelphia to work with his family. The truth is more bizarre. My sister last year on Ancestry.com discovered that my beautiful grandfather, Guglielmo, lived until like 1957. Uh, he had another family in Philly. He had, you know, we've got brothers. We've got half brothers and sisters all over the planet. So, but, but the, the short of it is, of that sordid story, is that um, my father was not raised speaking Italian. I was not. There was very little vestigial Italian. <coughs> Uh, culture in us. And I'm, I'm not even Italian, I'm Sicilian. And there is a nice little rivalry between Sicily and Italy that Italians will get into. The people of the north, the people of the south, we're not even in the south, we're, we're getting kicked by the boot, right, in, in Italy. So Sicilians have a very special uh, identity uh, issue also. And it also, Sicily also happens to be the motherland home of the organized crime uh, uh, culture that was popularized in um, The Godfather. They're, the Corleones are from Sicily. They're from, and they are from Corleone. Right? They are not just the Corleones, they are of Corleone. The town is named for them. And this idea of the name, the name Corleone, the name being bound up with identity, but also, I'm going to put the word space. I'll put the word city. It's Corleone all the time. He is one of the building blocks. And I think it's one of the reasons this film is so popular. Because Coppola, a film like this doesn't transcend uh, ethnic boundaries and become a mega bestseller in the United States unless it touches a chord. And what this film touched was this chord of the idea of familia. Familia. Who we come from, who are we, where do we come from, what do we call the dirt we stand on? For some reason, our species is very territorial, very territorial, very touchy, very sensitive, especially when it comes to name, space, what I'm calling dirt, and so forth. But let's, instead of me just talking about it, let's start to look at some of the scenes that document, document this. And this is a, this is a public Tumblr site. I can have Clarissa send it to you. It's just a way I, I have of organizing uh, my lecture. This is the first scene that we're going to see. And it, it features a, an undertaker. In fact, the first person you see in The Godfather, the first person you hear speaking is not a Corleone. It isn't The Godfather. It isn't anyone. It is Bonacerra, the undertaker. 
which is, if, if this was a lit class, I'd say, oh, the opening scene of The Godfather is with an undertaker. Is that what we call foreshadowing? Well, yeah, duh, right? There's going to be a lot of deaths. There's going to be a lot of murders. Bonacera here is going to have a lot of work. But uh, that's the, almost the least interesting thing about the opening scene. Uh, what's most interesting is that the movie opens with a soliloquy about America and about being American. Doesn't start with anything about Italy. Doesn't start with anything about gangsters. All the first thing you're going to hear is about America. Okay, and so, and this again, not an accident. Coppola knows what he's doing. I'm going to start it again. I always like to study films at university with subtitles. Uh, a lot of people hate them because they're a distraction. But because we're focused on the text, not just the image, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the subtitles. So we're just going to bear with them. Just, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to show you something later. I want to set this up. Without even telling us, the camera has started to, is on a dolly. It's coming back. And the reason for that is we've been in tight. We started tightening his face. And we're going to see, we're going to see Don Corleone in a second. But, uh, Gordon Willis, the DP, director of photography, palette, absolutely dark. Oh, the editors hated this film. It was so hard for them to process to get the look that they wanted. But Willis, Gordon Willis, the director of photography, working with Francis Ford Coppola, insisted that the film be almost a midnight palette. Okay, so we're seeing seeing this, but we'll we'll see in a second as the camera pulls back the the, the slow reveal.
Never wanted that friendship. Yeah. We were afraid to leave like that. I didn't want the death in your fault. I understand. I found paradise in the mountains. I was afraid and I didn't know the police protected you in the courts of law. They wouldn't leave it to me. What does the word friend mean in that whole exchange? I mean, we're, what, the, what the godfather, Don Corleone, is doing is making him aware of the choice he made, right? To be a good American. And the cops, and the courts, and everything's going to be okay. But now you need to come to me, right? You didn't need a friend like me. And I love that he has the cat, right? That cat is, is almost perfect, because... He feels. It's almost like he's all emotion. Yes, he's Don Corleone. Marlon Brando, had, you know, one of his signature roles, one of the greatest actors in American 20th century cinema, um, with a lot of cotton in his mouth. That's how he's doing that, right? But with the little pussy cat, you know, but what we're talking about here is murder and family and especially honor honor, right? Because the, the whole, the Godfather begins with the narr narrative of a story of a girl who didn't put out and was, had the shit beaten out of her, her face destroyed. And now the father seeks justice. And he's not just any father. He happens to be, you know, his child's the, the godchild of uh, Vito Corleone's uh, uh, wife. And so it's, it's like familia. Chance around this man like yourself should make enemies. 